right, so I hope you guys can see the screen now. Yep, we can see you. So welcome. So um, it's just me today, Erin Sheldon, and we're just talking about uh, predictable chart writing, which will be very familiar to any of you who maybe have experienced kindergarten um, or just working with other um, really emergent kids, kids who are just really on that cusp of starting to figure out what what literacy is, what how language and literacy intersect, um, and how we can really develop those skills. Today's webinar, we will be describing uh, predictable chart writing as an instructional strategy. So this is really a webinar designed much more for teachers. Um, we wanted to be able to create this as a resource so we could later uh, direct teachers and speech therapists to it to uh, better understand the, the strategy of what we're, what we're showing here. Um, we have some pretty hardcore moms who are really determined to master predictable chart writing at home. And I'm actually going to be um, cautious about really encouraging too much of that, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about when and why we would do this um, and how predictable chart writing is different from other forms of shared writing, but how all shared writing really fosters and supports uh, communication development for our kids. We will also be trying to just um, help you better identify the developmental continuum around communication and writing so that you can better develop um, goals that are most appropriate for your student and have a better roadmap of what you are working towards. So um, using Maureen's five steps, this is a webinar focused on a teaching strategy and the tools that you will need to use this uh, a really good communication system with the best co core vocabulary, such as you're using it with uh, word power, you're using um, proloquo to go, you're using speak for yourself. Um, any of those will work very well with this. Um, or any of you who are using pod books, you'll find that that also works very well with this. And this webinar really picks up from a webinar that Carolyn Musselwhite and I did on October 22nd. It was webinar number 11. It's available on the Angelman Syndrome Foundation website um, and on their YouTube channel. And it was kind of our introduction to writing as a form of supporting communication and how to begin modeling writing. And when we talked about modeling writing, we were really talking about our most emergent kids. So, for example, you have an emergent kid if their communication system is relatively new, and if you were to say something to them to um, try to encourage them to finish a sentence, if the concept of that might not make sense to them just yet, because they haven't seen enough examples of it. So, for example, um, if you wanted to write a book about all the things that your child likes, if they can use their system right now to open it up, maybe with some help from you for navigating, actually start showing you things you like, then you've got a more advanced kid. They have more advanced skills, they have more advanced experience, um, and this webinar is really designed for them. If you have a student or a child um, who's newer to this, and if you were to say, hey, let's look in your system, let's use your words, Where, what are some of the things you like? I know what I like, I think I know what you like. And your student would observe this, your student might enjoy this, um, but they haven't yet learned how to kind of finish that sentence, how to follow that up, then by all means, watch this webinar, um, work on predictable chart writing, but that first webinar back in October um, with modeled writing might be a better starting place. Um, so take a look at this and we'll go from there. In that webinar in October, we introduced this instructional framework um, to really start figuring out where your students are at so that we can develop um, better goals for where it is we're trying to move them towards. You'll see that in this pyramid, uh, the foundation of the pyramid is awareness, exploration, and imitation. So that's the foundation of learning. That's the foundation of knowledge. When we start, um, when we get our, our student communication system and we start modeling the use of it, in the beginning, our students may not even watch. They may walk away. They may have no idea what we're doing with it. So our first goals are really just to get them aware of it. They need to know that there's a way to talk touching symbols. 
Um, they may not be aware of that in the beginning. They may not yet have had experience with um, any form of language that they could access. They may not be aware that there's a way that they could access. They may need to just start exploring it. And all of us have gone through this where we got our child a communication system and then we say they're just completely random. They're just going all over the place, opening it up, closing it down, touching random buttons. That's the exploration phase. And that's fine. That's totally what we expect. We need kids to first become aware that this is even possible, and then they start exploring it. And then we start to see some imitation. And, um, and that's the kind of thing where maybe with lots of prompting or support, we actually start to see kids beginning to use their system. But it's, also, it's often highly invited. Um, it's often not something that's just completely spontaneous. And what matters about that phase is that kids are learning the motivation so that they will be motivated for all the hard work of learning that follows. If you don't see language as being powerful, if you don't see language um, as being personally meaningful, if you don't see books as being something that's relevant to you, um, if you don't know what writing is or why you would want to be any part of it, then you're, you're just simply not going to have the motivation to stick it out um, and learn all the skills that you need to learn in order to do it. So that initial stage, you can't skip it. You can't coerce children um, into being ready. We can't discipline them um, into being ready for um, greater levels of involvement. They need to first understand why this matters, why this um, makes their, them more powerful, why it makes them able to interact in the world in a way that's more uh, rich and more meaningful to them. So if you have students at that initial awareness, exploration, imitation stage, that is absolutely fine. Recognize that, honor that. We're going to work from that starting point. Once kids start to understand what these systems are, what writing is, what reading is, then what they really need is to be able to predict what's coming so that they can begin to participate. Um, and we all know this. So for example, some of the first books that we read to kids tend to be highly predictable. Um, we read books to kids with um, things like brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? I see a red bird looking at me. Red bird, red bird, what do you see? I see a yellow duck looking at me. The reason we read those books is because kids have become aware of books and they've become aware that there's a story to it. They've been enjoying exploring their books. They like to pick up a book and imitate all those book behaviors like turning pages. And now they're able to start predicting the language that's coming. And so now they're cognitively engaged with reading. And at that stage, when kids can predict what's coming and can now start to have real participation, that's when they believe they can do it. Every child believes they can read before they can read because they've had so many repeated readings with predictable books that they've memorized the books or memorized parts of it, and they therefore believe that they're part of the process of reading. The same thing happens with writing. I personally think the same thing happens with communication, that now all of the stuff is starting to make sense. We provide the scaffold. We provide the framework that lifts them up and provides them with that early success, and then from there, um, they can start developing skills around mastery and independence. Um, so I'll go into that a little bit more later in terms of how that relates to predictable chart writing, but we covered this in that October webinar, that October 22nd webinar. And if you want to see more of it, you can check that out. It's heavily based on the work of Dorothy Hall and Elaine Williams, um, particularly their building blocks. So any of you who are teachers are going to be familiar with um, the four blocks model of literacy, um, and the building blocks was materials developed for kindergarten teachers, with the idea being that the four blocks make a lot of sense as kids are becoming conventional readers and writers. They know what their letters are, they know what words are, they know that words are made up of letters, they're starting to spell, they're starting to read, they're starting to recognize words. So that's really where the four block model makes sense, but for our kids who aren't there yet, they need a more developmentally appropriate um, form of instruction, and that's where the building blocks model came from. And it's just an absolutely lovely framework for thinking about um, literacy instruction as well as language development for our students.
And today we're talking specifically about the instructional strategy of predictable chart writing, which they have an entire book on um, that's absolutely excellent. So if you want more information on this, and especially if you have students who are at that more advanced stage where they can start finishing a sentence, where um, what you're doing with the communication system when you start commenting on things you like and they now start offering what it is they like, that's really where they're ready for this strategy. Um, and I encourage you to find um, this four blocks book on predictable chart writing and, um, and check it out. I think there's about 60 um, examples that you can use from there. This is also a little bit of repetition from the October webinar, but it's just to make sure everybody's up to speed. Remembering that we can't separate literacy development, reading and writing, from language, because literacy is language, it's just visual. And this is extremely important to remember for our students um, with Angelman and other complex communication needs, because they can't produce language in an oral form, and therefore, everything we're asking them to do with language tends to be visual. Um, there's other forms of language, you know, there's uh, sign, American Sign Language, there's all that kind of thing, but what we tend to talk about here, what most of our students with Angelman are learning to access, is language in a visual form. Therefore, what we're working on with our students with Angelman is literacy. Um, they're learning that spoken words can be represented visually and that they can access those words, they can use those words. What they're learning through writing is that what we say, we can write. Also, what other people say, I can write. I might not be able to say it, but I can write it. I can represent it visually um, using a communication system, using the symbol set of the alphabets. Um, what our students are learning here is that when we write something down, we can share it. So I might not be able to approach someone and tell them the really funny story of what happened on my way here, but if it's written down or I can represent it visually, I can still share that experience. And so everything we're doing with literacy and language for our students is really showing them how they can interact socially um, and form deeper relationships, more intimate relationships with the people around them. Um, and all of this is based on models of language development, both oral and written or oral and visual language development that we've had for a long time. The connections between expressive communications, such as learning to use an AEC system, a communication device, are directly linked to the development of writing, the ability to represent language visually. And being able to represent language visually, if we think of that as writing, if we think of language in a visual symbol system as writing, then we realize that what we're asking our students with Angelman to do when we ask them to use a communication system is actually to write. And so for our students with complex communication needs, um, what we're working on around communication is really a form of writing instruction. And this is really crucial because we know that learning to use a communication system is more like learning to write the, the stage that kindergartners go through and first graders go through as they begin learning to write. It's more like that cognitively than it is like learning to speak. Because when we learn to write, we have to take all the ideas in our head and somehow translate them into a visual symbol. Um, we have, we are, we are limited by whatever visual symbols we have. So we can't simply generate the sounds of a new or novel word. If we can't speak it, then if, um, because we have communi complex communication needs, if we can't speak it, then we're limited when we go to translate our thoughts into whatever visual symbol we have, um, or whatever sign system we can use. So writing really is expressive communication for our students who cannot speak. Um, and what's even more important for those who have lots of um, performance anxiety, those who have lots of apraxia and really get frozen, their bodies kind of freeze when they, the more motivated they are to try to, to physically do something, the more that their bodies freeze. For our kids who have more dyspraxia, where just that motor coordination and motor planning is the most impaired. 
writing helps remove some of those real-time demands so that they can generate a message ahead of time and share it in real time and be able to really focus on the interaction rather than the demands um, of trying to actually generate a message while you've got an immediate audience watching you. So everything we're doing around writing is supporting how our kids are going to be able to access their communication system. And the reason this is so is that if we look at, um, for example, a kindergarten student, a first grade student, a typical early writer, they have this huge vocabulary of all the words they understand that are spoken around them. But they're much more limited in the words that they can speak. Um, they might recognize a word when they hear it, but they don't actually own that word well enough to speak it. Um, but they understand its meaning when and their parents or their teachers use it. So their spoken vocabulary is always going to be smaller than their receptive vocabulary. But then the words that that student can represent visually are going to be much fewer as well. So if you look at what a six-year-old says and then what a six-year-old can write and spell, there's going to be a huge gap there. Because it's one thing to be able to speak a word, and it's another thing to be able to generate that spelling and generate a way to speak it in visual form, communicate it in visual form. For our students with Angelman, the whole speaking part is off the table. And so they have all the words they understand, and now the words that they can generate, the words that they actually know in their communication system, but they don't have that middle ground of all the words that they can speak that they just can't represent visually. So as we work on writing instruction, what we're really trying to do with our kids is help them know many more words in their AAC, in their communication system, so they can be much more fluent um, about accessing those words because that gap between what they understand and what they can generate is always going to be huge unless we can really, really build that up. So in October, we talked about what is shared writing. Um, and shared writing is the training wheels, right? So shared writing is when we're writing with kids um, and we're providing the training wheels so they can participate in the activity. It's that scaffold. We're writing with them. We're generating meaning together using print, um, doing that together. By doing that, we're teaching them why why we write. Um, we're going to use their communication system to construct that message together so that they realize, so that they learn that they can be part of this whole speaking, reading, writing world out there um, that may have not previously seemed um, accessible to them. Typical kids don't have big barriers to observing why other people write. They see mom sit down and write out a grocery list and write out checks. Um, they see writing, they see their parents and all the people around them writing Facebook status updates and sending text messages and checking email. And all that incidental learning is enough for most kids to make them realize that writing is an important activity and that we need to be able to read and write and communicate just in order to get things done, to do what we need to do. Um, but our students have a lot of barriers um, to learning incidentally that same way. And so when we start doing shared writing with our kids, what we're really trying to do is just be a lot more intentional. We can't rely on them simply observing what all of us are doing because chances are they can't do it the same way anyway. When I sit down and write out a grocery list, Maggie can watch me do it, but she doesn't have the motor skills. She doesn't have the motor control to be able to form letters right now, even if she knew how to spell them. So that model, that watching me write, will be something that's always inaccessible to her unless I do shared writing with her so that she can um, watch what I'm doing, slow down using something that she can also use as well. Um, for a lot of our students, they need more processing time, and so when we go to actually write with them, we're generating a message, and as we're writing it down, we're actually creating some time for them to just absorb what it is we're doing. Um, and shared writing really allows us to easily target vocabulary, and you'll see that with the predictable chart writing as we talk about that. Um, that if we're just really organized about how we do our predictable chart writing, then we can target vocabulary, um, provide a lot of repetition as we read what it is we write, um, and really uh, get our kids' skills up. 
we have to, as we're doing shared writing, we have to use the child's language. Our person with Angelman needs a model of how to use their system to generate the messages. Whether we're doing it in real time with communication or whether it's something that we're doing uh, with more deliberation and more care ahead of time, which is really what shared writing is. We're going to write about what the child knows, what the person cares about, using their level of language, knowing that many of our kids have had barriers to developing more language, whether it's their auditory processing, whether it's their vision skills, whether it's their dyspraxia, their attention, um, their language is likely delayed, and we're going to figure out um, what level of language we should be writing at so that it's a model that, uh, that they can learn from. We're going to use think louds. We're going to be talking out loud, and that's one of the real strengths of uh, predictable chart writing, is it teaches us to be very explicit and to think out loud so that our kids can observe us writing and understand what it is we're doing and why. Um, they can uh, kind of get a window into that internal process in our brain that we do automatically when we go to write. And I'm going to encourage you if you're following this series, to use a core four that we talk about each month uh, for sentence stem ideas because your sentence stem is just your carrier phrase. Um, it's just that uh, predictable phrase um, such as I like, I like to, what is it I like, what is it I like to do. Um, your sentence stem is those, those uh, high frequency words that we'll use over and over again and that form the basis of so many things, um, so many messages that kids with at early language levels, the first things that they tend to say, the first things that they tend to be able to read, the first things that they tend to write, tend to be those sentences that we can construct using the core vocabulary um, and the core four that we highlight each month. So there's a difference between modeled writing and predictable chart writing. Predictable chart writing is a form of modeled writing. It's much more explicit and systematic. It's, there's a whole five-day lesson plan that teachers use to do this. Um, there's the same activity that we do on day one versus day two versus day three, day four. So kids can really, again, predict the process, predict what the strategy is, know what's coming, be able to participate. Um, it is a group or classroom adaptation of what would otherwise happen at home if our kids didn't have disabilities. If our kids didn't have disabilities, they would watch us writing at home, they'd observe us talking at home, and that incidental learning would be enough that they could show up on the first day of kindergarten, and chances are they would know what words are. They would know what letters are. They would know the concept of a sentence. Um, they would know that they can generate a sentence. They would be able to finish a sentence. Um, they would be able to convey meaning all that way if they didn't have disabilities. But their disabilities created that barrier. And so now we have to try to replicate that early literacy experience that most kids just get at home just from observing. We have to try to figure out how to replicate that in the classroom. And our teachers want to do it in a very organized way, and that's where we come up with the system of predictable chart writing. If you are a parent, um, maybe unless you're homeschooling, but if you're a parent, I really encourage you to just watch the October webinar on shared writing and feel free to stick with that. Um, what that was really about was figuring out what are the things that our kids might want to talk about and writing books with them and to them and for them that they could share who they are, um, that they could use in interaction, that they could read for fun so that they would have simple homemade books that they could just really um, enjoy that reflect everything that matters most to them. If, um, if, you, if you are a parent, that is enough. If you just do that, that really is more than enough. And what we suggested you do then is very similar with predictable chart writing. It's just, it's less systematic. It's less, um, it's less of a formula. But you're still doing what families do at home to develop language and literacy. Um, I'm always really struck by how so many parents, they hear about predictable chart writing, they understand its value, and yet it seems to create um, a huge level of anxiety um, because, oh, am I doing it right? And, oh, is it day two or is it day three? And, oh, we did something for day four that we were supposed to have done on day two and we forgot to do that. And 
none of that matters. If you're writing with your kids, if you're using their communication system um, and you're generating messages together and you're reducing those messages to writing, then you're doing it right. Um, and I really, I'm not sure that we gain much value um, in those kind of home activities by trying to take it to this next step. Where I think it's really important um, is for those kids who have developed um, strong knowledge about what words are, they really want to be able to develop um, conventional sentences, they want to be able to generate conventional messages that they share with other people, they're really learning their communication system, and then for those kids, predictable chart writing may, might make a lot of sense at home. They already understand the purpose of writing, um, and this will really foster their, their use of the communication system. So what is predictable chart writing? Well, first of all, it's predictable. We take a specific sentence frame or a sentence stem and we repeat it over and over. A group of us all use the same sentence together. We do this on a chart so that we end up with a list of sentences or a sequence of sentences that all start exactly the same so that kids can really predict what the message is. Um, for example, the sentence frame might be, I like, and our theme might be animals, and I might start it out by saying, I like jaguars. And the next person might say, I like polar bears. And the next person might say, I like cats. And then, you know, our child might go, I like cats, because it's I like cats too. Um, or at least in their heads, beginning to understand what this whole system is. So that's what we're doing. We're just taking a sentence frame and we're repeating it. Uh, we're going to do it in a chart, so all those sentences are together in one place, and so that they're easy to compare. So kids can start seeing what's the same about each sentence and what's different. And they start drawing conclusions about, well, what's different is who said it and what the specific animal was that they liked. But look, there's all these other things that are the same in each sentence, such as I like is actually the same. There's a real short word with a tall, skinny letter followed by um, you know, the, just the word I. And then there's followed by this other word that also starts with a, it starts with a letter L and it's very short and it's repeated through all of them and as we say it over and over um, what that chart does is really start uh, teaching kids lots of early early literacy concepts so it's predictable it's on a chart and it uses really high frequency words what in this uh, communication training series we call core words um, that's what we refer to when we're talking about a communication system but it's also what a teacher would really refer to as sight words. And what we're doing is we're taking those really high frequency words like I and like, and we're combining them with those really concrete words, those really important to me words such as cookies, such as lions, such as kitties, such as my sister or my mother or my father, um, such as McDonald's, right? So we're taking what it is kids care most about and we are combining it with those really high frequency uh, carrier phrases that allow them to make a whole sentence that really shares who they are. And predictable chart writing has a whole five-day lesson plan, so it carries over the course of a week. There's lots of repetition because you end up with a homemade book um, that really reflects the likes and preferences and interests and activities of all the kids who helped produce it. So it tends to be a very popular book to read, and we love those books. That resulting process of getting these homemade books, um, the whole the process of making the books teaches kids a lot about literacy and communication and the process of reading them again afterwards is a way of providing lots of repetition that doesn't actually feel like a drill. So you can see some examples here. Um, this is uh, Carolyn Musselwhite at an Angelman Syndrome uh, family camp where we had done predictable chart writing using the carrier phrase, I like, and kids used their communication systems or pictures or um, whatever visuals we had to talk about what was it we were doing at camp that we most liked. Uh, so you can see that some folks liked water play books, watermelon, and you'll see that one person likes swimming and the next person likes swimming. And that's that, in the, that might very well be that imitation stage of learning to access language where you just go, me too, um, and take someone else's idea and claim it as yours, and that's an early stage of participation, and that's awesome. So this is what a predictable chart looks like. 
and it's really quite simple and it doesn't have to be fancy. We can do these kind of things, especially if you're a parent. Feel free to do it just really quick and dirty on the fly. So I think this was just something we've made. We were on the way to the zoo. I could not actually get Maggie to participate whatsoever, but she was sort of watching all this out of the corner of her eye, and I just um, had all of us finish the sentence, what is it we wanted to see at the zoo? I want to see penguins, Aaron. I want to see lions, Ella. So this is just a really I want to see polar bears, Jordan. I want to see leopards, Sarah. So this was using a $3 app called Explain Everything just to make a video of it because my daughter, Maggie, has um, combined vision impairment as well as auditory processing impairment, and she really needs that repetition of seeing things afterwards. Simply doing it once in person doesn't give her enough time, and so we use this really simple app um, called Explain Everything and turn as many things into video as we can. And having that recorded audio and that visual of the arrow going across the page is just something that she finds it very easy to attend to, and she probably watched this video maybe 50 times. This was when she was at the stage of more just observing. You could kind of tell from her response um, what she might be most interested in, but the reality was we were going to the zoo and I've got a kid with vision impairment. I'm not sure that very much at the zoo is actually something she can access, except that she loves the walking. She loves the people. She loves how social it is. I honestly have no idea how much of the animals that she sees. And so the fact that I chose animals for our chart writing activity was actually, in hindsight, probably not a great choice. Here's, um, you saw that picture of Carolyn holding the I like chart at camp. And this was uh, the silly book that they made as a result. So they used a different really fun app just called Kid and Story Bookmaker where they took each child um, with their sentence and made sort of a really fun over-the-top photo about what it was that they had liked. So Brenda liked her pepita, her, her soother, pacifier. Finn likes trains. Sophia likes watermelon. So we just made these. This was just, um, again, I think it's like a $5 app. Um, but just a real simple way to then take the chart and reduce it to book form. Um, this is a homemade book from a family in California who really took the idea of predictable chart writing and just ran with it. So here is I Love Ava at the Beach, as written by her sister Mia. I Love Papa at the Playground. I Love Ava and Mia at the Park. Here was an example where we actually, um, the carrier phrase was I see a, and we used um, the child's symbols to illustrate the page. We're not doing symbol supported text. The symbol isn't directly over the word and paired with the word, but we actually used her symbols um, to just help with comprehension of the sentence. And we just end up, at the end of our predictable chart writing, we should end up with a homemade book. It can be laminated, it can have these fancy illustrations, such as the ones you just saw, or it can stay paper glued. It can be very, very simple. Um, and just remember that this is about literacy. This is not about Pinterest or being Martha Stewart. So whatever gets it done, gets it done. So here's an example. Um, Maggie's class does a lot of predictable chart writing. And they did a lot of this last year, made a lot of these homemade books by targeting some vocabulary that they were trying to really emphasize each month the same way we're doing in this communication training series, and then using those words um, in predictable chart writing with a small group of, uh, of classmates to make these very simple laminated books. And there were days like this where Maggie was observing what was going on, but really didn't seem to have any interest in participating. Um, she enjoyed watching. Uh, while they were writing the I Want To book, this was maybe a month or two into doing predictable chart writing. And Maggie was still at a stage of really just watching, but not yet offering a way to finish that sentence. But while the other girls were constructing their sentence, they're using her Proto Quota Go system, and they're creating their sentence, you know, I want to buy. I think what Maisie actually wanted to write was I want to shop. 
I want to fly. Maggie was picking up markers and drawing. And so when they invited Maggie to be more part of it, when they invited her to look at her proloquo and add something, or look at the photos and add something, they said, you know what you really like to do is draw. You clearly want to draw. And they just ascribed meaning to what she was doing, took a scribble that she was doing, used that to illustrate the page. So that was how she participated. In that. By doing predictable chart writing, here's what our students are learning. They're learning the functions of print, that print matters, that it's important, that it gets things done. You know, if I go to the grocery store and I don't have my list, I'm not going to get my grocery shopping done, and some of my favorite things I might actually forget to pick up. Um, print is fun. Print allows me to socially interact with other people. When I have a book about me and I can share it with someone else, then I have um, much more rewarding interactions with other people. So it makes our students value print and learn the meaning of it. It makes them more motivated to communicate and read and write. They want to be part of that literacy flow, that communication flow that the rest of us are part of. Um, they begin to learn print concepts. So just the awareness of print, that those squiggles on the line are print and that they convey meaning and that they represent words that we speak. They begin learning the concept of word in a sentence, that a word represents a word that can be spoken. So a written word represents the spoken word. And you can put multiple words together and form a sentence. And what's really important in sentences is things like having letters that form words, having things like spaces in between words, and having punctuation. We learn that print goes from left to right, and that we read books from front to back, and we learn how to make those eye motion movements, the eye tracking movements, to be able to actually follow print along. We learn some early phonological awareness, and predictable chart writing is particularly good for helping students learn the concept of word, and learn that we take a string of words and can separate them into their individual ones, and arrange them, and rearrange them, and we can change the meaning of a sentence if we add a new word. So if I say, I like cats, and I add a word like not, I do not like cats, I can completely change the sentence, and I can rearrange the order of the words, um, and that changes the meaning too. Kids begin to learn their first um, sight words. They begin to recognize their first words when we do lots of uh, predictable chart writing and shared words be and shared writing. Because what we're doing is taking these really high frequency words like like and I um, and see and do, um, and we're combining them with the words that represent the things our kids care most about. So we can make a book about all the foods they like and all the foods they do not like and the places they like to go and the places they do not like to go and all the people they like and the characters they like and the activities they like, and they begin to develop um, that word recognition, both for some of those high-frequency words as well as um, those specific nouns like people and names that they care about the most. And our kids learn that they can read, that they can write, and that they can share. And that belief that you can do this, that belief that you can be part of the process of reading and writing um, is really key. Kids will not have the motivation and the attention to sit down and learn all the hard work that goes with using a communication system, that goes with generating print, that goes with reading and writing, unless they believe they can be part of it. And what predictable chart writing is intended to do, it's a very multi-level instructional strategy so that that every child can experience success um, with generating the sentence that they can read because they helped generate it um, and that they feel they helped write. If we look back at that instructional framework that we shared in October, where we said the beginning stages of learning are really that awareness. You're aware of print, you're aware of speech, you become aware that words um, can be represented orally by speaking them or by writing them down with print. Um, we start to explore them, babble, imitate, and now we start to really want to participate this in this process and predict it. Um, long before we have the skills to do it independently, we can do this with support. If we look back at that instructional framework and then we apply it to what predictable chart writing looks like. In the beginning, for our most emergent kids, what we're working on is that they're just going to observe us writing. 
And if they're at that observation stage, then feel free to stick with what we talked about in the October webinar on shared writing, where we're really creating a model of writing for them to observe, um, where we're writing about what they care about so that they develop more awareness um, of what it is. Then we want to start seeing some response to what we're putting out there, such as agreement or disagreement. So if we start doing predictable chart writing, um, the first thing we have to do is generate an idea. What is it I like to do? Ah, that's actually a difficult concept. That's a difficult skill, being able to brainstorm and generate ideas and choose the message that you're going to share. Um, narrow down all the things that you like in order to just convey one. That's a tough thing for a lot of kids to learn. So in the beginning, they might just be agreeing. They might, um, if we say, I like swimming, then they might be at the me too stage. And that's great. Um, that, that just shows that that's where they're at. And then they can add an idea. Now we can start offering a whole range of things that they like. And they can actually pick one. And they can finish the sentence. And now we're starting to see that higher level of participation. Um, and we're not going to expect them to be engaged in predictable chart writing at that word by word level. And until they first are motivated by this, until they first find it personally meaningful, until they've observed enough models of it, enough fun with it, they've added their ideas, they've experienced how, how much this allows them to just interact more, they've finished the sentence enough times, they completely predict what it is. Now we start talking about kind of word by word using your system to uh, actually generate the complete sentence for example. Um, so we're not expecting our emerging kids to take their system and say, I like to swim. What we're really working up to is first they're observing us do it, then they're starting to agree with us or disagree with us, then they're starting to um, offer an idea such as swim, and it's going to be down the road before we're expecting that, that kind of word by word sentence construction. But that's the beauty of predictable chart writing. It is very multi-level. Um, and this is why it works so well in a kindergarten classroom or first grade classroom where kids show up to school at all different levels of sort of literacy readiness based entirely on, in most parts, the opportunities that they've had to engage with print, to see print in use, to be read to, to explore books, um, and to have access to language. So predictable chart writing supports our kids who are at that observation stage because they're going to learn the why. They're going to learn the fun. They're going to learn that it's really fun to sit down with a bunch of people you like and talk about the things you like and like to do and the things you don't like um, or the things that you think are stinky or whatever it is that we make our sentence frame. Um, they're going to take it to that next stage of really wanting to participate and explore and imitate um, and start to be part of the process. They're going to be able to, once they've had enough observations and they kind of get what it is we're trying to do, they can follow the pattern. And as we're reading a chart that says, I like to, they start hearing those words in their own heads and having that, that level of cognitive engagement with what they're doing. They start really participating and supplying that final word, finishing the sentence. And eventually, they're working on kind of word by word constructing a whole sentence. But predictable chart writing supports kids and students at all these levels um, of experience. Grateful chart writing as an instructional strategy comes with kind of a, a five-day um, uh, lesson plan. So on day one, we're really practicing uh, generating ideas, figuring out what's the idea that we want to share with other people, and then dictating a sentence that's going to get written down on the chart. We're going to then read that chart out loud, and then we're going to set it aside because we're not trying to sit down for two hours um, and work on this every single day. The next day, we're going to get that chart out again. We're going to reread it again, and when we read it, we're going to touch each word and help kids really see that left to right movement as we read to help start making that one to one correspondence between how we speak the word and when we touch it. So we're just going to touch it as we read it. We might clap the words as we read them. We might you know, bang on our desk the words as we, as we read them. We might nod our heads as we read the words. But we're going to really spend some time just exploring those sentences and seeing what we can do from it. On day three, we're going to have sentence strips. 
So if I said, I like to swim, and that was my sentence, I'm going to get that as a strip and we're going to cut it up so that we can really see and experience how a sentence is made up of individual words that can be rearranged and we can change the order or we can match the order on the chart um, and we can then generate the same sentence. We can even steal a word from the person next to us in order to change our sentence. On day four, we're going to do lots of sentence building activities and on day five, we're actually going to glue our sentences down to make our books and to illustrate them. So I'll just kind of break down um, each day a little in more detail now. We're going to do predictable chart writing though with a group. It is a group activity. I personally find it very difficult to do one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So if you're a parent um, or a teacher and you're looking for a chance to do this, um, you might actually go back and look more at um, that October webinar um, and just look at different shared writing ideas. You might not try to do predictable chart writing if you can't in some way assemble a group. Uh, when it's a kindergarten class or a grade one class, we might be able to do it with the whole class. It's a very developmentally appropriate activity for um, your entire kindergarten first grade class. You might do it with the whole family. You might do it with a small group or a multi-age group. You might draw in your English language learners because these kinds of um, sentence building activities are really ideal as well for our students who are just learning English. Um, you might draw in any struggling people because this is really fairly simple. So for example, Maggie's in grade seven, but there's still peers who are struggling with their reading and writing in a way that this really boosts their confidence to be part of it. And when we ask other kids, other peers, to be part of predictable chart writing with our kid using our child's communication system, that makes it much more complex for those other kids and they begin to learn just how difficult it is to use a communication system. When they then, when they have to say, I like to swim, and they've actually never really explored the communication device before, they suddenly realize how much effort goes into it and how much they need to learn it. So the way that I make predictable chart writing more complex and more sophisticated so that it's age appropriate for much older typical peers is by making sure that everyone's using the communication communication system uh, so that they have to experience that. So on day one, the very first thing, the thing that's most crucial to predictable chart writing is generating ideas because that's the, the primary purpose of writing that we're really trying to work on. That's generating an idea that you can share with other people is really the essence of both communication and writing. So our adult, our teacher, our parent is going to pick a topic that students care about and a sentence stem. So whatever vocabulary they're targeting. So if you've been to the zoo and your kids really like animals, then maybe you're going to have I like and the topic is animals. Um, maybe it's going to be foods, maybe it's places we go, maybe it's restaurants, maybe it's toys, um, whatever it is that your kids care about. But what matters most in terms of the topic that you pick is that it's something the students know and it's using the language that they know. So what is it they like, what did they do, what did they see? We're going to use their communication systems and any other visuals that would be helpful to support their comprehension as we brainstorm this. So maybe we'll watch videos of the zoo, maybe we'll look through our photo albums, our, our iPhones, our iPads to see pictures of what we did over Christmas, um, all that sort of thing in order to generate those ideas, get a whole bunch of ideas out there. We're going to write them down, we're going to keep those visuals so that our kids can, can pick one and can be part of that. Um, uh, that, that experience of generating that idea, deciding what idea they're going to share. We're going to find the keywords in the sentence and their important to me words in their communication system. So we're learning to navigate their system. We're going to try to say our sentence with their system as well as be able to, let's say our child um, points to a photo of their favorite rice pudding and that's what they want in the I like book about food. We're going to figure out how to say that with their communication system. And if that word isn't in their system, then we know right there that's a word that needs to be added because that's clearly an important to me word that needs to be there. And we're going to dictate those sentences. We're going to write them all down and we're going to reread the chart together. 
the way that we'll dictate the sentence is that the parent or the teacher is the, the first model, we're the best model, so we're going to go first and we're going to write the sentence. Um, we're going to add our name at the end of the sentence, just like you can see it on that bullet point here in parentheses, so that our name is there. Names are tend to be one of the first sight words the kids learn. The first sight word that they can recognize is their name and the names of other um, people who matter to them. So the role of names at the end of the sentence is really key here. We're going to ask our strong models to follow. It may be that we only have a group of three or four people and that may actually be what's best uh, for our students. Uh, it might be that we've got a whole class and we're going to just do half the class on day one and we'll do the other half day two, whatever works best. But we're going to have several models so that we have that list of sentences. And if possible, we're going to have everyone use our students' communication system so they all have to experience generating that sentence. And so our student has that model of other people generating that many sentences using their communication system. With my daughter Maggie, what she really likes about this is when we video record the other students using her communication system and she will spend hours watching these video models of other students using her communication system to generate these uh, these repeated sentences. And our most emergent student, our target student, is going to go last um, because they're the ones who need the most models so they can begin to predict what's expected of them. And if they won't participate, we're going to invite them. We're going to do everything we can to show them how fun this is and we're going to ascribe um, meaning to whatever they do. So that example you saw of where the kids were making sentences of what they want to do and what Maggie was doing the entire time was drawing while observing them doing it. So we ascribed meaning and um, her teacher wrote down that she wants to draw. We're going to start with the kids' communication system. Um, and their system is just really key here. Whatever you're using for their communication system needs to be the basis of the message we're generating. Otherwise, we're showing them we can write, but we're missing that connection that what we write is what we can say, what we can communicate. Um, so it can be using the pragmatic functions in their pod book. Right? So we'll model how to say, how would you say that I like this in your pod book and now we're going to write it more in its conventional form um, rather than using the, the sort of pod language for how we actually write it down. But either way, it doesn't matter how we do it that way. We're going to form our message and we're going to have already kind of picked a theme about something that we know our students really like so that that word that comes at the end is something that's really important to them. And if you just look at any uh, core word-based homepage, you can see the start of so many sentence frames right there in front of me, in front of us. So, what are the things that I am? What are the things that I do? What are the things that I want? What are the things that I like? What are the things I want to do? Do. What are the things that I have? What are the things I want to get? What are the things I can make? What are the things I can do? Um, where are the places I can go to? Um, what are the foods that I like to eat? How can I help other people? What are the things that I like to see? So, you know, we can see dozens of arrangements of words just using the core words in front of us on what's really a fairly um, limited uh, symbol set where we have some core words and some categories. So we can talk about nouns, like people, places, things, um, toys, objects, using the, the nouns category. We can talk about foods. We can talk about the activities we can do. Um, we can talk about feelings. We can talk about people. On day two, so we've generated our ideas and we've made our chart. We did that the first day. On day two, we're going to read the full chart. And we are going to read the full chart every day of the week um, because that rereading, that repetition, is a huge part of the value of predictable chart reading. We're going to touch read the pages. So we're going to touch the words as we read the chart and help kids make that connection that the word we're speaking is the word we're looking at. Um, we're going to have all of our kids use their inner voice. Can you hear this? Right? So even kids who can't read the sentence out loud, who can't repeat the sentence out loud because they don't have speech, they need to develop that inner voice. They need to predict what the sentence is going to say and hear it being spoken in their own internal voice so that they have that level of cognitive engagement with what they're doing. And 
when they get to that stage where they can predict what's coming and they hear it being spoken with their inner voice, then they've reached a very significant early literacy milestone and they will believe that they are readers even if they don't know how to read yet, but they will believe that they can read um, because they've been able to have that level of participation. We might program the words um, onto something like step-by-step step, or use our child's um, communication system so that they can hear each word being spoken individually. Um, we might do it, we might create it, the whole sentence word by word if we have a student where that's appropriate for them. And we're going to talk about what we see. So what's the first word, the last word, do you see some long words or short words? Do you see some important letters? If your name is Jessica, do you see any other J's? We're going to talk about where we see spaces versus letters, where we see punctuation, which is our chance. And it doesn't have to take more than a few minutes. On day three, we're going to create sentence strips ahead of time so that all the children, all the students have um, the whole sentence that they help specifically generate, so their sentence in front of them. Um, we're going to read the chart again, um, and now we're going to cut up their strips into individual words. And one of the biggest mistakes I see folks make here is the educational assistant takes the strip and just starts cutting well, the educational system already has concept of word and already knows that a sentence is made up of individual units called words and they're separated by spaces, but our kids may not know that yet. We can't let this be incidental learning. We really have to be explicit. We have to think about where do we cut? Where does one word end and the next word start? And if our student tells us to cut right in the middle of a word, we're going to cut there and then we're going to say, oops. Oh no, we cut your name in half. It says just Ika. We gotta put that back together and we're gonna use tape to correct it. Um, and put it back together again and now talk again about where to be cut. And it might be that our major goal for our students, this might be the stage that they're at, is learning where to cut, learning to see those spaces in the sentence and understand where one word ends and another one go, uh, starts. That might be um, our goal for them on those days for quite some time and that's absolutely fine. But what matters here is we're inviting them to be part of this exploration. We're going to cut up the words and we're going to rearrange them and arrange them. We're going to try to match the model of the chart and we're just going to see what happens um, as we have fun cutting these words up. And kids tend to love cutting up things that adults made for them anyway. So there's always kind of a sense of mischief that I'm cutting up a sentence strip. On day four, we're going to reread the chart again. And we already have our sentence cut up into words, and so now we're going to try to match our sentence in front of us. Can we now recreate the sentence on the chart where I said I like to swim? Can I recreate that with my um, cut up sentence strips, and can I put them in the right order? So I'm going to start really learning things about word order, and I'm going to be working on concepts like first and last and uppercase and lowercase and letters versus punctuation and long words or little words versus short words. Um, I'm going to start really attending to things like initial letters. Uh, I'll get some clues about what word is a name because names always start with an uppercase letter. But you can see all the things that we can learn from these kind of sentence building activities. And on day five, we're going to build the book. So again, we're going to reread the chart. We're going to glue our words down. Um, we can model off the chart so that we're just trying to replicate the sentence that we're presenting on the chart. We're going to illustrate our pages. We might draw something. We might paste something. We might cut pictures out of magazines, whatever makes sense to us. And then we're going to produce a book. And this producing a book is the publication stage. And it's what shows that this whole thing mattered, that um, I did this hard work of writing and it resulted in something real and tangible um, and it resulted in a book that I can read and reread going forward and so something happened because I was part of this and now I've got this book and I can read and share it if I'm a classroom teacher I can put it in my book corner we can reread it as often as we want to um, if I'm a family member or this is a book really made just for my students then they can carry it around and show the world who they are when they show off their book. Um, the more that we read this book with them, the more predictable it will become. And really, if we have a truly emerging kid, one of our goals is that they will memorize the book. 
that they will get to know that book so well that they don't even that they already know what the next page says before they've even turned the page. And when kids have memorized a book, they believe they are readers. They know they can read. And that's just such an important milestone for them. So they can use this book to start off conversation with other people, but they can also really use it to um, to reinforce who they are as readers. Especially if you're a parent, don't overthink this. Um, if you are writing together with your child, if you're a teacher or a speech therapist and you're writing together with your student, then you are doing something right. And that by itself is something to celebrate. Um, anything that involves modeling a communication system, inviting a student to be part of it, and that results in a book is good. So if you are doing things with books, modeling, and invitations, then what you are doing is awesome and keep doing it. If you miss a day, if you miss a step, if you feel like you're not doing it right, you're doing it right because you're still doing, having this level of engagement um, with books and with language and modeling and invitation. And so whatever you're doing is actually right. And you can go back can learn more of the mechanics of each day by getting that critical chart writing book. If you just look on, on YouTube, there's some phenomenal examples of critical chart writing. And um, we'll post a link in the ASF training group page um, with a particularly uh, expert uh, example of some of the exploration we can do with predictable chart writing. But um, you know that if you are trying to do this, you're doing it right, and what you're doing is incredibly valuable. Do involve others. Use their peers, use your other kids, use your other family members, whoever else you can draw into it because really predictable chart writing is meant to be a group activity. Um, and that's why it's so particularly valuable for so many of our students with Angelman who really want that social connection. This is what makes reading and writing social. This is what makes their communication system so social. And when they can see other kids using their communication system. There just isn't a better model in many cases than that. Um, involve families. If you're a teacher and you're doing this at home, let the family know that we're writing an I like book about our favorite foods and see if, uh, if we can get the family to do that at home and send in those extra pages and now we can make a separate book just for our kids. And we can do that vice versa. If you're family and you're doing this at home, then keep sharing with the school what it is you're doing and encourage the school team to watch these webinars so, uh, so we can get some carryover into the classroom. Um, you cannot have too much repetition with any of this stuff, but if you just take a look at the core words that we've talked about, um, if we take a look at any of our communication systems that we're using with our kids, there are so many people and things and places and activities that they love that are represented in those systems, and we're just using these core words as a way to access them. So just using the core four that we've done over the last few months, here are some sample um, sentence starters such as I like, I like to, I do not like, I want, I want to, I help, I want to get, I make, I see. And that's just um, a short list just based on the last few months and not even the whole top 40 that we'll be doing. So you've got weeks and weeks worth of ideas because even just the I like books, I find you can do, and I like, just by adding the word not, we can use the carrier phrase, I like and I do not like, um, for months worth of activities. Carolyn Musselwhite has a Pinterest board. Her Pinterest name is Carolyn Musselwhite, so she's easy to find. And she has a whole uh, Pinterest board just with more predictable chart writing resources for anyone who wants more information. For next steps, just choose a sentence frame. Just choose that carrier phrase, that whatever it is. I like tends to be one of the easiest because there's just so many things that our kids tend to like. Assemble some kind of small group and try it out. It can be Sharpies on paper. It can be a ballpoint pen on whatever paper you can pick up. You can do it on an iPad. If that's what makes the most sense, just make sure everybody can actually see what you're writing. Um, Try this out and share with us in the Facebook group uh, how it's going for you. And we will problem solve with you and troubleshoot with you. Um, and let us know what's working and what's not. Uh, so before we take questions, uh, just to remind you that the ASF communication training series is made available by the Angelman Syndrome Foundation 
grew a generous grant from the Foster Family Charitable Foundation in California. And now we can take questions. Okay, I just had to unmute myself. I almost forgot. Um, let's see, we do have a couple questions. Um, Marilyn has her hand raised, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute her. I think she has a couple questions. And Okay, Marilyn, go ahead. Hi, Erin. Thank you for the lecture.